5 interesting aeroid facts nobody asked for. Before we proceed, we should define what an aeroid is. Aeroids are sometimes known as Arum or RSCA family, best characterized by its distinct inflorescence or spedex. Life forms in the aeroid family varies largely. It could be fully submerged in water, it could be free-floating aquatics, terrestrial, semi-epiphytic, epiphytic, or it could also be climbers. And before we move on, I'm going to be showing some photos on the screen as I talk about some of these aeroids. And disclaimer, some of these photos are not mine. Where possible, I will give you credit for the photos, but that's not always possible. And I apologize beforehand. I hope that you are okay with me using your images for educational purposes. I'm not selling any products and I'm coming at it purely from an educational background. And just so you know, any photos that I've put out on my Instagram, also online, or any of my video clips, you're welcome to use it as long as for non-commercial purposes, as long as not for advertising or selling any products. Now that we've got it out of the way, let's go with fact number one. And I'm gonna be looking at the screen sometimes because I don't have really, really good memory and there's a lot to cover here. But fact number one, the aeroid family comprises of 114 genera or genus. Genera is the plural for genus and it consists of about 3,750 species. Now, a lot of websites have conflicting numbers and I'm sure it's being updated all the time as a lot of plants are being reclassified all the time, but we'll take this number as kind of a ballpark. Fact number two, we kind of categorize aeroids into two categories and that is new world and old world. The new world is basically the American continents, the North and the South Americans. And the old world aeroids are actually from the African, European and Asian continent. Now the vast majority of the genera occurs in the new world with about 75 genera, while the old world consists of around 46 genera and with only about 10 genera overlapping, which means that they exist in both worlds. Now I'm actually curious to know what those 10 genera are that can be found in both worlds comment down below if you can guess what it is I haven't really deep dived into it but maybe that's something interesting to talk about in a future episode now if you want to break it down further North America has about 24 genera and unsurprisingly South America has about 38 now some examples of old world aeroids are Aglonemus, Alocasia, Emidrium, Colocasia, Cirtosperma, Epipremnum, Homalomena, Raphidophora, Scandapsis, and the Zamiococcus. Now the last plant is actually endemic to Africa while the rest of the other plants are largely from Southeast Asia. Some example of New World aeroids are Anthurium, Caladium, Diffenbachia, Monstera, Philodendron, Thermotophyllum, and the Syngonium. Fact number three, one of the oldest cultivated crop in the aeroid family and probably the most successful is the taro or the Colocasia Esculenta. Now it originates from the Bay of Bengal, I believe that's in India, and it was carried by early Polynesians and Pacific voyagers through Oceania and throughout Asia. It's been found in Japan and China as far back as 2,500 years ago. Now taro is believed to be one of the earliest cultivated plant and an excellent source of dietary fiber and good carbohydrates. It's also considered a superfood because it's got high levels of vitamin C, vitamin B6, vitamin E, and it helps maintain a healthy immune system and may eliminate free radicals. Now raw taro is considered very toxic due to high levels of calcium oxalate. So to consume taro safely, we're going to have to cook it pretty thoroughly. And for those of you who are unfortunate enough to never try a taro before, it's sweet and nutty flavor that we might compare with a sweet potato or yam. Some of the ways that it's consumed is steamed, curried, taro chips or fries, in ice cream, frozen yogurt, in milk tea, and in bakery. Fact number four, the Amorphophallus is actually an aeroid. And the most popular species is the Titan Arum, and it's got large flowers that is extremely smelly. It smells like a corpse, which is why it's known as a corpse flower. And every seven years, it would produce these amazing inflorescence. It would heat up because I saw a documentary where they actually use thermal imaging, and then it spreads its odor far and wide to attract pollinators. Now in ancient Greek, amorphos means without form or misshapen and phallus means penis. In other words, amorphophallus means misshapen 
penis. Now there is another popular ammo for phallus which you may not know about which is the cognac. It is actually native to Yunnan and the ammo for phallus cognac has been used in China, Japan and Southeast Asia as food source and traditional medicine. Flour extracted from the corm of the species is used in Far Eastern cuisines to make noodles, tofu and snacks. Personally, I like them in my hot pot. There's this cognac jelly that you can actually get. And sometimes they're also dipped into dessert. So you put them in sweetened kind of soup and just consume it. It's quite tasty actually. But it, they are also known to lower blood sugars, cholesterol levels, improve skin and gut health, and help heal wounds. And fact number five, did you know that anthuriums are the largest genus in the aroid family. It comprises of over 1,000 species. Can you imagine that? And they are all largely spread out across South America, with the Andrianum being one of the most cultivated in the world for its beautiful spedect, which people call flowers to this day. But this species has been hybridized there's a lot of cultivars, a lot of colors, a lot of mutations. I've even seen a beautiful variegated one that's gorgeous. And these guys symbolize hospitality, which is why they're found in hospitals, in clinics, in malls, or places where customer service is needed. Now, I personally categorize anthuriums into five different types. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But the first type would be the flowering anthuriums, which is the antrianums, and there are actually other species that flower beautifully. The next is the pendulate anthuriums, and those hang down beautifully. They look like neckties, with the common one being the anthurium vitarifolium, and that is an easy anthurium that I highly recommend. And the third one is the heart-shaped leaf anthuriums, which is very, very popular. They can either be glossy or they can be velvety, and they have been hybridized quite recently and they're quite making quite an impact in the houseplant market. Some of the most popular one is the Anthurium crystallinum, Magnificum, Clarinervium, the Vecii, and the Waracoyanum. The fourth type would be the bird nest type Anthurium, and this is what we call the Anthurium plumania, plumaniae here. I have an episode which I'm going to link up above at Eddie Pranoto's nursery. He's a hybridizer of Anthuriums, and he's really, really well known for his bird nest type Anthuriums. He fills them with color and variegation that is beautifully pink and red and all that good stuff. So I implore you to check out his work for bird nest type Anthurium. The lesser known Anthuriums are the epiphytic types, and these are the ones that actually really need a moss pole they will climb up access to better light and get better bigger and better leaves over time and i guess that's it five facts about aeroids that nobody asked for i hope that you found this interesting if you like this format please do comment down below so i'll know to make more of these in the future all right to reward those of you who stayed to the very end of this video i'm going to present a bonus content and i'm going to rank 10 most popular aeroid genus today so this is based on houseplant supply demand production retail quantity appearance on social media so these are not based on value it's not based on hype not based on current trends it's it's not based on significance in food production, so these are not for non-consumption, and it's not related to the population in the wild. So without further ado, let's start ranking. Coming in at number 10, it would be the Syngonium. They're quite prevalent in houseplant market. They're actually very difficult to kill. They're very good for beginners. There's many varieties and you can find many patterns, kind of coloration that suits your sensibilities. And coming at number nine is the Alocasia. There's also many, many types of Alocasias. Some of the larger ones are used in landscaping, but we also have the, all these jewel Alocasias that many people love and appreciate. Coming in at number eight is the Zamioculcus and this is the Zamifolia. They come in many varieties as well. You have the regular green, you have the raven, which is the black colored leaves, and you have the variegated ones as well. And coming in at number seven is the Skindapsis. Now this is very popular and they're usually grown for trailing, but then there are also some rare Skindapsis that do much better if you allow them to climb up a pole. There's many variegated varieties that are coming into the market as well. And number six, we have the Diefenbachia. These are also popular houseplants. They are largely cultivated because they're easy and have this beautiful, gorgeous foliage, and they do well both indoors and outdoors. Coming in at number five is the Aglonemas. Now it is debatable which is more popular, the Diefenbachia or Aglonemas, but usually Aglonemas come smaller, they're more compact, so we tend to see them in a larger quantity than the Diefenbachias because the Diefenbachias can absolutely turn into larger indoor trees while the Aglonemas stay relatively small. So personally, I've seen more Aglonemas than Diefenbachias, but that may not be true depending on where you are. Number four 
is the Monstera, with the Deliciosa being the most dominant species in this genus. But there are many, many, many types of Monsteras, and I would guess that the second Monstera species that is popular would be the Adinsonii. They're usually grown bushy and trailing in a pot, but sometimes they can also produce large spectacular leaves if you allow them to climb up a pole or a wall. Coming in at number three, Apipremnum. Now, Apipremnum is actually your pothos, which is why I ranked it at number three. They're actually very, very, very popular in house decoration and styling. And a lot of people seem to like how easy they are to care for and how beautifully they trail. Although not many know that literally all epipremnums, including your epipremnum pinnatum and also your aureum, which is your golden pothos, if you allow them to climb up a pole, they can get large, beautiful, spectacular, and fenestrated leaves. And that is true nearly for all epipremnums. Number two, da -da -da -dum, I'm going to give this spot to the philodendron. Now there are many many species in the philodendron genus and also some hybrids are coming in. You have your terrestrial ones like your gloriosum but you, most of the philodendrons are in fact epiphytic so they like to climb up and it'll produce these nice mature form leaves and they're really really well loved in the houseplant market and I'm sure you already know many philodendrons that you like. The most common and the most I would say populous species would probably be the hederaceum usually grown in like hanging baskets they are really really trailing they're very bushy so in terms of population i would say that the hederaceums probably dominate in this philodendron market but i would say nothing can hold a candle to number one which is the anthuriums now when i say anthuriums a lot of people are gonna think of these heart shaped leaf anthuriums that we've come to love recently these crystallinums all these hybrids these veggies and waroquianums and the reason why it easily takes number one spot is because of the andrianums and these are the flowering type anthuriums that are known for their beautiful spedex and they're really really grown commercially in mass production and i don't have the number for this but they would probably come close to like orchids so these guys really dominate the houseplant market and we are growing them for the beautiful showy flowers that can bloom both indoors and outdoors and it can also bloom all year round there's many cultivars of these which means that we can enjoy many different flower shapes colors and forms with that out of the way i guess i'm really going to bid you farewell this time thank you so much for watching this episode i'm at Botanist news on instagram feel free to follow me on there for more information on plant care and also for upcoming episodes if you have not subscribed to this channel please do consider subscribing and do let me know if you like this format because it will help me in deciding whether i should put out more videos like this in the future take care now everyone bye